Well, yes, yes, yes. Uh, God bless uh, Nigeria. Right there. Hello, welcome to another training day right here in Lagos, Nigeria. Let's get to the top stories um, that sets your agenda now. Yeah, we saw that big drop in oil prices um, yesterday, but we're seeing a, a bounce back uh, this morning. Seventy-eight dollars forty-one cents a barrel. See Brent trying to get back to that um, eighty-dollar level. Uh, this morning, 1.15% up. Uh, the U.S. Um, grade there, that's $74.07, uh, $74 1.12%. So we're, we're seeing investors buy up those um, cheap prices we saw um, yesterday. That's the contracts, uh, the Brent's August um, contracts is up by $0.89 cents, um, this morning. Um, global benchmark, though, that's up about 1.78%. Well, from oil market, let's get a check on the Naira. Um, yesterday, we had some weakening, 0.78% um, against the dollar, 1,488 Naira. That's for NFAM. That was a close for yesterday. Previous session, 1,476 Naira. So, same weakening at the NFAM. But for NAFEX, uh, on the flip side, that was up 0.66% uh, to close um, yesterday. 1,476 Naira. Um, 12 cover and uh, definitely we'll keep our eyes on this uh, market weeks uh, the weeks ending um, tomorrow we'll see if uh, most of those interventions are going to play a part and maybe we'll get some kind of weekly gain um, for the naira this week so other stories now the center for promotion of private enterprise has lauded the federal government's accelerated stabilization advancement plan for addressing key economic challenges faced by um, the real sector investors as asap According to CPPE, this initiative tackles issues such as high interest rates, expensive port clearances, and hefty import duties, showing the government's commitment to our investor concerns and uh, stimulation of growth. CPPE stresses the importance of prompt implementation. Once the plan is re uh, receives a presidential approval, we'll be waiting um, for that. Uh, for some company news now. I will see uh, Fidelity Bank concluded all necessary arrangements to raise a total of up to 127.1 billion naira by way of rights issue and a public offer. The plan uh, culminated in a signing ceremony uh, between Fidelity uh, Bank and issuing houses at the bank's head office in Lagos. Uh, the combined offer is a part of the bank's strategy to increase its share capital base in compliance with the Central Bank of Nigeria's revised minimum capital requirement for Nigerian commercial banks. Take a listen. Subsequent to CBN's recapitalization circular published on March the 28, 2024, and shareholders' approval, Fidelity Bank PLC takes a bold step towards achieving the revised minimum capital requirement for Nigerian commercial banks. This informs the coming together of the board chairman and other board members of the bank, heads of issuing houses and other professional partners to append their signatures to documents that contain the MOU that will enable them to work together on the capital raising exercise. In a combined offer, Fidelity Bank hopes to increase its capital base with over 127 billion naira through rights issued to shareholders and a public offer. The fund raised will enable us to expand our business franchise, improve our IT infrastructure, and render better customer service experiences. We are confident that these investments will solidify our position as a leading financial institution and unlock every even greater value for our shareholders. Stambik IBTC Capital is the lead issuing house to the combined offer. They've heard the story, they've seen, uh, you know, the benefits and uh, the return that uh, shareholders in the bank they've been, got, you know, getting over the years. Uh, the offer also, you know, provide them the opportunity uh, to come and be a particle of this um, uh, good performance and good returns. Fidelity Bank says it is the first among a full-fledged financial institution to undertake rights issue and public offer in its recapitalization plan. Today we held our signing ceremony of our rights issue of um, 3.2 billion shares at 50 cobalt each and it's coming in at 9 naira 25 cobalt and also for the public offer of 10 billion shares at 50 ordinary shares at 50 cobalt each and that's coming in at 9 naira 75 cobalt. And uh, this shows that we understand the market and the Nigerian economy at large. Besides Stambik IBTC Capital, other joint issuing houses include Iron Global Markets Limited, Carry Asset Management Limited, Afroinvest Capital Limited, and FSL Securities Limited. Others are Future View Financial Services Limited, Iroko Capital Market Advisory Limited, Kairos Capital Limited, and Planet Capital Limited.
The Minister of uh, Finance and Coordinating uh, Minister of the Economy, Mr. Wale Edu, has uh, introduced the Accelerated um, Stabilization and Advancement Plan, ASAP, aimed at tackling key economic challenges. Let's look at the inflation uh, reduction angle you know, on the plan. Joining us now is Dr. Adesola Simone, uh, Senior Analyst, Financial Derivatives, uh, Financial Derivatives uh, Company. Join us via Zoom. Great to have you on the show. Thank you for having me, Ladi. So we're seeing uh, plans there to suspend import levies on food for six months. That's to ease inflation. We're seeing food inflation at over 40% uh, at this time. How do you see this move um, by the government or the plan? Um, on one hand, okay, let's say it's positive, right? It's positive because uh, the import levy is uh, adds to the cost of some of these commodities. And previously, we've seen, uh, since last year, we've seen the... The, the, the efforts by the government have not yielded much fruit. And so this is a, this is a welcome development, uh, the removal of or this planned suspension of, of uh, levies, particularly on staples, on fertilizers. I think that is positive. I think it will help, you know, reduce the landing cost of these commodities and kind of reduce the pressure on prices. It would also kind of help to boost boost our domestic production of some of these commodities, which is which is positive. Right, and definitely we see all the positives, but are there any risk uh, here um, at this point? Because we, we see food inflation over 40%, but is there any you know, angle to this that could pose some kind of risk? Because we know we're trying to you know, support you know, local uh, production and all of that. Is that going to impact us negatively? I think I think at the moment the risks are muted. I think in terms of local production, uh, 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 facilitating local production, the re removal of levies on fertilizer. I think that is positive. We know what is happening in 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 uh, Ukraine and Russia, and that is uh, directly affecting the cost, the import cost of fertilizer. So removing the removing the the, the, the levy, I think that helps with the cost of fertilizer. Also removing the levies on things like grain for feed for poultry, I think that is supportive. Removing the grain, the, the, the levy on grains on flour, which are like staples, I think that kind of helps to reduce some of the the, the to reduce the landing cost of some of these uh, really really important commodities, and that can really help to reduce price pressures in the domestic economy. All right, and the uh, proposed uh, suspension period will be for about six months. Looking at the situation of things right now, is six months enough, or should we be looking at maybe two years? Forty percent, over forty percent food inflation. Obviously, six months is a short period, but I think this is kind of like uh, uh, an initial phase. And then the, the, the government may extend it if needs be. For but for the initial six months, I think it is positive. Also remember this is this is also revenue for the government, right? The government is kind of forfeiting this 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 revenue. And uh, it's important to note that the government, if you look at the budget performance of this year, it is quite uh, 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 lower than expected, particularly because of uh, lower uh, oil exports, lower oil production. If you look at the budget benchmark, oil production is put at 1.8 million barrels a day by the moment we are producing around 1.2, 1.3 million barrels per day. So there's that there's that shortfall. So by 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 uh, foregoing some of these levies, uh, this this um, import levy levy for six months, the government is kind of trading off some of its revenue in order to reduce the hardship or improve help to improve the quality the, the uh, purchasing power, the quality of life of Nigerians. Right, and definitely I hope the uh, I hope government revenue is not impacted, you know, so much, you know, with this plan. But let's look at the global oil market uh, at this time. We're seeing um, prices uh, close to our benchmark. That's oil price uh, uh, benchmark for the 2024 um, budget, you know, at this time. $78. Um, big drop yesterday we saw in the oil market, but now we're seeing a rebound. There, there you have it, $78. That's the oil benchmark for the 2024 budget with an oil production assumption of 1.7 million uh, barrels uh, per day. So um, are we in trouble here with these uh, prices, these oil prices? Um, it's difficult to say at the moment because there are many factors driving uh, oil prices globally. And like I said, Nigeria's oil, Nigeria's oil revenue is more elastic to production rather than price and so if we what we need to be more concerned about is what we can control really which is our production i mentioned earlier reports from opec shows that uh, nigeria's production is around 1.3 million barrels per day from from for the month of uh, april april which is which is 
quite low compared to our budget benchmark of around 1.78 million barrels per day. And if you look at the global oil, oil space, the factors that drive it are pretty much out of our hand. Right? Look at, uh, we are hearing news about the that now our, our, our expectations that the U.S. would uh, cut their benchmark interest rates around either July or September, which is positive, which the market has viewed as positive in that it will stimulate economic activity and also stimulate all demand growth. Already we are seeing Canada has led the pace in cutting their benchmark interest rates and the expectations that many other high income countries would follow suit. And globally, I think this is positive because it would kind of stimulate economic activity globally and it would stimulate our oil demand. All right, and investors uh, globally are just bracing for when the US Fed is gonna cut you know, interest rates in 2024. But let's just imagine uh, that wake up one day and we see that the US, has, has cut, uh, US Fed has cut interest rates uh, for the first time. What's gonna happen to all these markets? I think uh, uh, first that would be positive because it's it's it kind of signals to to to, get to the global economy that there's going to, there's a change in the monetary policy stance. We are moving away from tightening cycle now to 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 a loosening cycle. And if the U.S. cuts, I think many other uh, uh, many other uh, uh, high income countries as well are going to cut their interest rate, and then that would globally reduce the cost of funds. Uh, uh, globally, so it would also stimulate investments, it will stimulate business activity, it will stimulate uh, economic activity, and I think it's positive all around. Right, it'd be great to see how that uh, plays out, definitely, but who knows, it might not even happen, you know, this year, but Canada is readily in the pack, we'll see if uh, the U.S. will uh, at some point this year, you know, cut uh, interest rates, but let's look at the um, Naira, we're seeing weakness uh, yesterday in the official uh, window, what, what would you say is driving sentiment at this time? I think at the end of the day, it's still uh, uh, the market is quite volatile at the moment. Uh, the, we are contending with issues of lower supply, uh, despite the the bumper uh, the bumper interest rates and despite the high yields on 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 fixed on in the fixed income markets. We have a uh, uh, three sixty five day uh, treasury bill around twenty five percent. I I think uh, 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 for foreign investors, I think there's still a little bit of of uh, anxiety on their path, despite what we are seeing, despite, you know, the, the, the hike in the increase, sharp increase in monetary policy rates, we are not seeing the, are not seeing a huge inflow of foreign portfolio investments. We are seeing trickles here and there. Uh, we are also, like, there's still also heavy demand on the market. I think once we begin to see globally uh, 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 a change in monetary policy uh, a stance globally, I think that would help uh, I, I, I increase uh, inflows of foreign capital into the economy and I think that would help. Also, we are seeing the central banks still intervene in the markets. Like I mentioned, uh, in May, we saw the central bank uh, uh, intervene around 575 million and, uh, US dollars in the markets in May, which is the highest this year and this was higher than the interventions in March and April combined, which were around 340 million. And so, I think the biggest problem is just uh, thin supply. And I think that uh, the central bank is doing everything that they can to improve improve supply and attract investments uh, into the economy. But I think foreign portfolio investments are still uh, a little bit anxious about the economy, particularly about repatriating their their profits or their 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 their, their, their profits after the investments. All right, Dr. Desola Simone, always great to have your perspective. So much to unpack there. We'll see how the week closes uh, for the Naira, definitely. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for having me. All right, we'll take a break now. When we come back, uh, what other sources are available for the federal government? Talking about uh, revenue, that's our next conversation. Do stay with us. Well, this is a critical time for Nigeria as the government needs to shore up revenue to meet its obligations. All prices uh, around the, the budget uh, benchmark at this time, even though we saw some kind of uh, uh, bounce back uh, with oil uh, this morning, but yesterday's drop was really big. A lot of talk about uh, tour, uh, tourism uh, industry, how much can contribute to our GDP. To help us understand how to make it work is uh, Denike Amakoli. She's the CEO 
uh, Wakanao, Nigeria. She joins me right here in the studio. Great to have you. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Good morning. Yeah, so I'm sure, um, yeah, let's go back now before we get into, you know, the industry. Mm -hmm. Two days. Mm -hmm. Two days we had industrial action mm -hmm. and uh, we saw flights yes. grounded. Paint yes. a picture, you know, for me. How much did that impact your industry? So domestic airlines operations were grounded really 100% um, on Tuesday. International, not so much, but it still impacted a lot of them because they decided to err on the side of caution and cancel their inbound flights. So it was very disruptive. Upon that, um, I think NIBS was also down. So even transactions, even new transactions were impacted beyond the ones that were actually waiting to fly on that day. So it was really, really disruptive. We understand, of course, uh, the reason behind it, uh, but still the airline industry is one that is always deeply impacted when there are these sort of disruptions. Right. And yes, this was the experience in the last couple of days. And if I want to put a figure mm -hmm. to that, the loss, what, what, just an estimate, you know, at this time to the industry. Um, on, a, on a daily basis, I would say the, the domestic, the loss to the domestic airlines would be in the excess of 10 to 15 billion. 10 to 15 billion. On a daily That's basis. a big amount. Yes. And we had that for about two days. For two days. All right, so it was one and a half days, so operations right. restarted yesterday. And we're not talking so, about the minimum yeah. wage, you know, at this mm -hmm. time. I know your company, you guys pay salaries, you know, mm -hmm. definitely. And we're all trying to find that national minimum wage, mm -hmm. that sweet spot. Mm -hmm. What would you say is the right number? Somewhere in the middle. Somewhere in the middle. Between um, the current minimum wage or what is actually currently being offered and what is being requested by the NLC. In as much as we understand the reasons behind, I would say the, the reluctance and, and the pressure it will put on the national budget, what is being requested by the NLC. But again, if we consider a living wage, um, 30,000, 60,000, with the core inflation today, food inflation almost being up to 40%, um, there needs to be a bit of a jump from the current offer, which is 60,000. So yes, that's sweet post spots is what we hope that yeah. we find. We're all trying to find uh, that. Somewhere in the middle. Yeah, somewhere, somewhere in the middle, middle at this point. Yeah. All right, let's look at the, you know, the industry, mm -hmm. you know, the tourism industry at this mm -hmm. time. We're seeing um, Egypt. Egypt led the pack in, in 2022 with about $12.2 billion. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what they, the receipts, you know, they made. Uh, Morocco followed, South Africa, Tanzania, mm -hmm. and Tunisia. Mm -hmm. And these were the top five, mm -hmm. you know, in, in 2022. And definitely we see the government here. We're trying to get, the government's trying to get, you know, revenue mm -hmm. in at this mm -hmm. time. Um, at, uh, for the Q1 data, I think about 3%. Uh, travel, tourism contributed about 3% to the GDP, GDP yeah. in the first quarter. Mm. So talk to me about where we are right now in the tourism industry in so Nigeria. Th there, there has been a bit of a growth, okay. I would say since COVID. Um, the factors that impeded the growth of international um, tourism and travel, outbound tourism as we call it, is what kind of contributed to the growth of domestic tourism. Um, what happened was, is with the increase in the cost, at least in the last year, with the um, airlines having their funds trapped for, I think, about 18 months to 24 months in, until the um, rate of exchange was floated and they started to repatriate um, a little bit, um, it forced customers to look inwards. Um, also with the devaluation of the Naira, your Naira is able to go much further if you look inwards. Um, however, despite this, this little growth that we've seen, which has also impacted domestic travel, if you look at the, the total number of passenger traffic last year, there was actually a bit of a shrinkage, but that was only on the international travel side. Domestic travel actually grew, which kind of supports the fact that there's been a, a bit of a growth when it comes to um, domestic tourism. However, this does not even start to scratch the surface with the potential that we have as a nation and what we can harness um, from tourism. We'll take some of these examples, um, South Africa, Egypt, what is driving the growth? What is driving this, this level of contribution to, from tourism to their economy? Um, I usually like to speak about um, the three A's right. of, of tourism. The first is attraction. Why do you want to go there? These five countries have a very active tourism board very active tourism ministry that is focused on positioning the country as the place they want to be to the sect of um, travelers that they want to attract. Um, South Africa, for instance, has been on this for a while and they remain consistent. My team just got back from a, a familiarization, familiarization tour to South Africa, right. even though we're very familiar with South Africa as a destination, but they continue to reinforce. When it comes to accessibility, um, visas, the countries that they want to attract um, tourists from, even within Africa. South Africa just um, relaxed their visa regime for Kenyans. And last year we saw, I think, about a 75% growth of inbound tourists from Kenya to South Africa. So these are the couple of things that 
we need to fix in Nigeria, um, accessibility, um, attraction, and also, so of course, infrastructural issues, security. Right. But those first two are always the starting points for positioning your country for real, real, real contribution um, from the tourism sector. Right, and definitely there's a cost of living crisis uh, at mm -hmm. this time. Mm -hmm. I remember, um, you know, I've checked, you know, travel uh, fares, you know, out of the country, and mm -hmm. um, the economy I see today, the price for economy flight, mm -hmm. that used to be business, you know, at yes. some point, you yes. know, so there's an afford affordability issue right mm -hmm. now. Talk to me about conversations going on in the industry, mm -hmm. you know, so that um, people can, you know, fly more. I know. As it was. It's really expensive. Yeah, it is, it is. I mean, it's a reflection of the, the value of the Naira as it is today. Um, last year, there was a bit of, I would say, an artificial inflation because of the airlines having their, their funds trapped. They decided to restrict the lower tickets, lower fare inventory from the market because they were forced to sell at the then official rate. So the, the fare that is today, let's say to London, $1,000. As of last year, the airlines were forced to sell at 463 which was 463,000 Naira. But they knew that they were probably not going to get their funds repatriated at 463, which meant that they started to hedge and restrict those lower ticket fares um, from the market. So you had the $2,000 fares available at 463, so you get it at probably under a million. Um, today, since the floating of the exchange rate, the airlines can now seek um, their funds and forex from multiple sources at the unified rate, which is closer to the market rate. So what that in essence means is today exchange rate is 1,500 to a dollar. That's what the airlines are selling at. Last year it was 463. Even if the airlines have taken the, the step to then open up all the inventory, today at 1,500, thousand dollars is 1.5 million that is why we're seeing this increase now in terms of what to do to ensure affordability um things like um as a business instrumental payments uh pay small small uh, we recently also introduced uh, price watch to ensure that Customers can plan their trips better. Um, Nigeria is a late bookers market, which means that most of the bookings come in pretty much four to seven days uh, before travel. Right. Um, and when you're booking four to seven days before travel, you're getting the, the most expensive, mostly the most expensive fare available. But if you are allowed to plan earlier, then you will get access to the cheaper fares. And that is what offering instrumental payments, having the ability to watch the fare. Um, price watch means that you can set like an alert on a route and it continues to send you how the fares are evolving within a week. So you can decide, okay, this is within my threshold, I would book now. So those types of um, instrumental, innovations. Instrumental payments sound you mm -hmm. know, good, but at what cost? Uh, so there must be some kind of interest. Yes. At the, at the end of the day, yeah, if you book let's say two months prior to travel, you can get that fare up to 50% less than when you book seven days to travel. So even if you're paying 3%, 5% for cost of um, credit, you're still getting it at 47% cheaper. So allowing customers to plan earlier by offering these payment options is what we as a business of course offer to, offer to travelers. But at the end of the day, Cost of traveling internationally is expensive. We encourage customers to also look um, inwards, should our tourism sector continue to develop. And we've seen that right. with the domestic travel actually increasing. We've seen that. Right. I know, you know, conversations um, right now about how expensive it is, mm -hmm. you know, moving within, you know, Africa. Mm -hmm. And if you look at, you know, um, uh, continents like Europe, mm -hmm. it's cheaper, you know, to move around um, Europe if, mm -hmm. as a European um, yeah. citizen. But in Africa, you know, we're seeing that it's really expensive, mm -hmm. you know, moving within Africa. Mm -hmm. What do you think Africa should be doing, you know, at this time to make travel within Africa mm -hmm. affordable? So part of the reason why travel within Europe is somewhat cheaper than what you get within Africa is uh, capacity. You have m more capacity um, available to travel from one country to another within Europe. Um, we can't say the same for, particularly for West Africa. If you're trying to go to Equatorial Guinea today, there is no direct flight. Um, when I was working with Lufthansa, I would have to fly to Frankfurt and then from Frankfurt fly to Equatorial Guinea within Africa. So a matter of in investing in increasing the capacity and air connectivity within Africa is the first step for us to start seeing that um, reduction in um, fares. Of course, it's a, it's the, it's a topic of um, supply over demand. Today, there is excess demand over supply, which is why the fares are high. But it's not the same in Europe. There's excess capacity, both by air, by rail, 
by land, by sea. So there are options. Once we start to explore the options that we have, even beyond air, uh, we would start to see a reduction uh, to, to a level that should be affordable right. uh, for intercontinental within, within travel. Africa. Yes. All right, talk to me now, agenda setting. What mm -hmm. should the Ministry of Tourism be doing right now? This government needs revenue. Mm -hmm. What's first steps to get revenue from tourism? Because we have a lot of absolutely. tourism in Nigeria. Absolutely, absolutely. I think the first step is what has been done, establishing a ministry um, of tourism. Right. Prior to this dispensation, there was never a separate ministry of tourism. Now we have a ministry of tourism that is focusing on um, the policies that need to be in place to ensure that tourism is prioritized as, as one of the, the sources, the alternative sources, to reduce the overdependency that we have on the oil and energy sector um, today. And a lot of policy review is going on, um, engagement with the private sector as well. Um, I was interestingly on a committee, on a subcommittee to review the existing um, Nigeria tourism policy and it, it's great that now the private sector is being engaged because a, a way to actually kickstart and jumpstart um, that contribution from the tourism sector is by harnessing the capacity and the opportunity and the resources that we have in the private sector. So the, the, we are at the starting point now, uh, policy review being done with the private sector, also enabling public-private um, partnerships. Right. Um, in South Africa, one of the things that they've done to, of course, increase um, accessibility within the city um, is the Gao train project. When right. you land in Oar Tambo, there is a train, high-speed train that can take you to Pretoria, it can take you to, to Johannesburg. That was a public-private project. So you, you see that the, the countries that are invested in those areas that would enable you to unlock tourism, attraction, positioning your markets in the light that it should be seen to enable people who even want to come, accessibility, um, visas, is your visa accessible? When you get in there, how do you come? Your public infrastructure, all of this needs to be in place. I'm sure security plays a of, of course, massive security. role in there. Massive role, massive role. So I was on the committee reviewing um, security and travelers' experience, really. And I can tell you that the Ministry of Tourism today is actually in that phase of reviewing the policy, setting the policy. But the most important thing is funds allocation to ensure that they are able to execute right. on, on what is in paper. Fantastic. Well, we'll be looking for the contribution for 2024. And hopefully we get some you know, good contribution going into 2025. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you. Adenike Macaulay, CEO, Wakanao, Nigeria. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you for having much. me. All right, so uh, there you have it. We're going to be looking forward to the close uh, today. That's for the um, local stock market. We did get um, that uh, move yesterday. There was a little bit of profit taking, you know, definitely, but we still ended positive. Um, that's for the market. 0.24%. That was a jump there. 132 billion. Um, that was what was added. But um, who knows? Maybe it might be a positive week uh, for the stock market uh, right here in Nigeria. We'll definitely um, watch out for that. Thank you so much. That's it from me on Business Morning. I have things over now to the Sunrise Daily team. I'm Laddie Williams.